Thank you, Nita, very much. Oh, boy, that sounds loud. Let's try this. Can you hear me? Um, I'm delighted to be here as part of the series. I uh, want to thank uh, Professor Farahani and also many of the others associated with the Science Society program and the MA uh, in uh, uh, policy and, and uh, bioethics. I think those are wonderful activities and they sort of reflect the kinds of things I'm interested in. I'm a political scientist who was at two universities before I joined AAAS in the mid-1980s. and I think I really found my niche uh, in the sense that this was a, an interdisciplinary organization that dealt with very active issues uh, and sort of required outreach and engagement with all sorts of constituencies. So for example, we, uh, we have a program to educate judges federal and state judges about uh, the impact of science on the law. Uh, we have programs that uh, reach out to uh, uh, postdocs to bring them to Washington uh, for a year as part of our science and technology public policy fellowships to give them some experience in the policy arena, but also to give our policymakers access to their expertise. 
And in some instances, they stay in Washington. In other cases, they may go back home, wherever that might be, uh, to apply the knowledge and experience that they have. So I think there's a real synergy between what you're doing here at Duke and what we do at AAAS. How many of you have heard of AAAS before tonight? Oh, okay, good. Well, I hope that you know of us not simply because we published something called Science, this weekly rag that we publish, uh, but also because we have a lot of programmatic activities and do a lot with regard to science education. But let me turn to uh, sort of why I'm here tonight and tell you, begin with a little story, if I may. Um, probably part truth and probably somewhat of an urban legend, but let me share it with you anyway. It's very brief. It seems that this group of scientists and engineers came to Washington, D.C. for the purpose of learning a little bit about public policy and how it's done. And uh, their first morning, they're at breakfast, and they have a breakfast speaker. Um, and he, the breakfast speaker, during the course of his remarks says, and I want all of you to be sure that you understand this, that in Washington, facts are negotiable. Well, this causes a little bit of concern among those in the audience. Facts are negotiable? What does he mean by that? Uh, a little discomfort there. Then they go on to lunch where they have another speaker. Uh, we're very good in Washington at combining meals and speakers. Um, <laughs> have another lunch and speaker. And in, during her remarks, uh, she says, I want to emphasize uh, something to you. Um, and that is, in Washington, we treat facts a little differently than the rest of the country. So again, there's some mummery in the audience. What is this? What's going on here in Washington? And finally, they, they, they go to dinner. In this case, they don't have an after-dinner speaker. They have a pre-dinner speaker. And he gets up there and he says, look, I want to tell you something. I want to make sure I'm going to be straight with you. I want you to know this, that in Washington, it's perception that counts, not facts. Now, that story may be, again, part truth, perhaps part uh, urban legend, but there is a message there, and that's the message I'm going to focus on. I'm going to try to make a case, the missing link, if you will, that I'm referring to uh, in the title of my talk revolves around the notion of policy literacy. I suspect a lot of you probably have encountered the term scientific literacy or science literacy, the idea of getting the public to better understand and know what science is all about. I'm giving a different kind of talk. I'm going to talk about the role of scientists in the policy arena and what they need uh, in order to be more effective. And in that short story, a lot of what I have to say has been captured. So I'm going to start with a little bit of audience participation. So I'm going to show you a picture. I'd like you to look at it for about 10 seconds, and then I'm going to ask you what you saw. You ready? And by show of hands, I'm going to ask you what you saw. At least I think I am. <laughs> Okay, how many of you saw the face, you're looking at a face where it's on the side, it's in front of you, woman is looking forward, how many of you saw a young woman? Okay. How many of you saw an elderly woman? Okay, fewer, fewer, and how many of you saw both? Okay, I'm not going to ask whether you didn't see anything, <laughs> that would be too embarrassing. Okay, so you all looked at the same picture, but you saw something differently as a general audience. I mean, number of hands went up for one, or number of hands went up for another. So let's, here's another picture, about 10 seconds. Okay, how many of you saw the head of a rabbit? Okay, and how many of you saw the head of a duck? Okay, and how many of you saw both? Okay, all right, so again, you all looked at the same picture, and some people saw one thing, and some people saw another, and some people uh, saw both. Uh, our minds are telling us what we are seeing, what we are perceiving to be there, whether it be a duck or whether it be uh, uh, a rabbit. Okay, now this phenomenon, if you will, that people can look at the same thing and see different things, is also true with regard to the auditory senses, not just the visual sense. So some of you may be acquainted with one of my heroes, Dilbert. 
It's the first phrase. Someone told me your presentation was confusing and unpersuasive. Sometimes one person's inability to understand looks like another person's inability to explain. I don't understand what you just said. See? <laughs> now, I hesitate to show you this next slide for two reasons. On the one hand, it so nicely captures in one sentence what I'm trying to get across tonight. On the other hand, it is somewhat disconcerting that all my hard-earned scholar, uh, scholarly work can be summed up on the front of a t-shirt. But here it is. I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. In other words, you can talk until exhaustion sets in. And it doesn't necessarily mean that at the end, the person to whom you're talking or persons is going to have any different opinion than when you started. And part of this, of course, is what they think they're hearing, or what they're seeing, or what they're tasting, if that involves something, to, a food or a drink to taste. They are perceiving something, and that leads them, if you will, to develop a sort of perspective on how they will view things. And that's a very important consideration when thinking about debates and discussions and the policy process. People come to the table with certain perspectives that are based on all of the experience and knowledge that they have absorbed in their lifetime to that point in time. And that's what you are dealing with if you're a scientist entering the policy process. You're dealing with policymakers who have certain perspectives on things. You're dealing with various advocacy groups that have various perspectives on things. And somehow, you want to try to influence them. You want to try to educate them. The biggest mistake you can make is to simply say, if only they knew what I do, they'd be much better off and be more sympathetic to my perspective. But that's not the way it works. And one of the problems I see in dealing with these matters day in and day out at AAAS is that many of my scientist colleagues just don't get it. They just don't get it. They just think, if, if I talk long enough, somebody will be convinced. And I just want to make sure that as an initial premise, what I'm saying basically is that if you're going to be engaged in the public policy process, or probably any other activity, but that's not our focus here today, it's really very important to understand who you're dealing with and what is it that leads them to this particular perspective uh, or position uh, that I may take. Now, this isn't new. The Greeks knew about it way back when, and the Romans uh, knew about it. Now, it's important to note that the fact that people have different perspectives does not necessarily mean that one view is better or more right than another view. But what is important to know is that's what will drive someone in terms of his or her attitudes, beliefs, and actions. So you have to deal with this day in and day out in the context of the policy arena. But then one might ask, well, what's this got to do with science? Well, the fact of the matter, this perspective and the influence that perspective plays on us, the influence it has on us, plays out among scientists as well. Scientists are no, no more immune to this phenomenon, if you will, than anybody else. They come in with certain agendas. And it's through the lens of their perspective, their experience, that they view things such as the experimental design, such as the data that sit in front of them, how best to interpret it. That interpretation, in a sense, is applying a particular perspective. Here's just another quote that I think just emphasizes on. Again, it says, scientists draw on their personal and collective knowledge when making decisions all through the scientific process, including, for example, the types of research questions asked. The very fact that you want to do research on something, whatever it might be, means you already have a predisposition in some way toward doing that kind of work. You might think it's important for society, for your career. You might want to be doing it because you think, aha, I can get some really good collaborators and attract some graduate students to my program. There may be a lot of reasons, but the fact of the matter is in choosing something to study, you already are predisposed to thinking about that subject matter. You have some ideas about what should be at the end of whatever the experiment might be. 
the research design, the kinds of statistical analysis that might be applied to that study. Again, to a certain extent, based a lot on the experience and skills you already bring to that. If you took a PhD scientist in one place and a PhD scientist in another place, and they were interested in the same problem, they might attack it from very different perspectives. Nothing wrong with that. Just a matter of fact that I wanted to share with you. And also, very importantly, the way findings are reported. This is very important because, of course, this is the way that you communicate with your fellow scientists and then the rest of us, if you will. And it's very important for those of us who are not scientists to understand that when scientists are reporting things, they are reporting things with the kind of perspective that they bring to the issue, to the problem. Now, science within science system has a variety of correcting factors, things like peer review, uh, things like reproducibility which I'm not going to talk about. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses. But the system is set up to try to counter the perspective that any particular individual or research team will bring to a problem. So when you're reporting something, there is a tendency, perhaps, and I think we'll see that that's true, uh, to report it from a particular perspective. Maybe even making it sound better or look better than it really is. Maybe. Just something to, to, uh, to think about. So again, just to make this point, science does not speak for itself. Every scientist gives voice to the data, to the measurements she has made, to the analysis she has done. And that's what I want people to understand. This is going on in the lab or in the field, just as it goes on in the policy process. So it shouldn't be terribly surprising that when scientists engage with the policy process, they're taking some of those same habits, good or bad, and applying them into the policy arena. It makes perfect sense to me. Okay, so how does this play out, if you will, in policy? Well, when thinking about the relationship between science and policy and how science can inform policy, there are at least three fundamental questions that I think we have to ask as both scientists, citizens, and as policymakers. One is, what counts as scientific evidence? And it's not unusual for scientists themselves to disagree about what constitutes scientific evidence. Those of you who know something about the courts and the law know that they have their own framework for thinking about what constitutes evidence, if you will, that will be considered. Scientists also fight their battles over what constitutes evidence. How strong is the science? Is it enough? Is it sufficient to support action? If you can't read that cartoon, it says the scientific community is divided. Some they say this stuff is dangerous, some say it isn't. There are those disagreements, sort of scientific uncertainty. But it's an important question to ask the scientists. And that is, you know, to what extent is the evidence of such caliber and power that it should cause us to take action, whatever that might be. And then, you know, how do we go about weighing the scientific evidence, if you will, and its power, et cetera, against all the other factors that policymakers have to take into account? Science is just one of those factors that policymakers need to take into account. So I think I can sum up this session, uh, this section of my talk, very succinctly by saying, if you haven't figured it out yet, this policy arena is really very, very messy. It's very messy. It's not neat. It's not clear. It's not straightforward. There are a lot of different players. And think about what a policymaker has to consider. Oh, okay. So, you know, the policymakers operating in an environment in which there's political uncertainty, which means she's very concerned about that, limited resources, limited time. Sometimes the issue is really hot, the public is ready, sometimes it's not. And the public just isn't ready, no matter what the science tells them. And then, of course, there are various stakeholders with their own values and their knowledge bases, etc. And the scientists are among them. We are one of those, if you will, one of those multiple stakeholders with regard to the policy process. And all of these things are evolving 
around in the policy arena. And this is what policymakers see. This is what they sense. And this is what they have to deal with. And in a messy environment, sometimes it gets very frustrating for scientists who simply want to simply cry out, if you will, and say, look, the science tells us we should do X. And even if the science did tell us we should do X, there are a lot of other things that have to be considered when meshing science uh, with public policy. And I like this quote very much. In the arena of social policy, evidence is filtered through a set of political values, and actually you could say all, all sorts of values, not just political values. And knowledge is mobilized selectively in a process of continuous negotiation. You remember my little story about in Washington, facts are negotiable? Well, what's happening, what happens in the process is all the different stakeholders take the knowledge that they have amassed, either directly or through others, to try to mobilize their members, their constituents, if you will, toward action. And this is going on constantly every day in the policy process, whether it's your state legislature or the National Congress, all the time. And in fact, some, some may see certain facts, if you will, to the extent that they are facts, as much more powerful than others. But in some cases, it's, in the policy process, there, there is no easy way to weigh those things. It's a constant battle. Sometimes the battle is won by those who are the loudest. Their science may not be the best. But that's the democracy we live in. And that doesn't mean we should give up hope. Clearly, science has a can have potentially a great deal of influence. It is highly respected. But it doesn't always carry the day. And what I'm trying to portray is the possibility that that's something that scientists ought to know and ought to learn in order to engage in the policy process. Better they learn it ahead of time than when they are uh, in, this, in the process. So just to sum up, if you will, there's the individual comes to the table with values, knowledge, and experience. That determines what information she might seek, how that information will help her assess her reality, and lead her to take a certain action, which could be no action at all, of course. This is what's going on all the time. It does as individuals, and it also does as groups. Now this next slide is probably the heaviest when it comes to text, but bear with me because I think it probably sums things up about as nicely as anything that I could do originally. So I'm going to read it for you. It says, people are often inclined to accept data and interpretations that appear to validate their prior views. They may search for any evidence that their preferred conclusion is valid and stop once confirmation is found. By contrast, people tend to view with suspicion data that contradict their preferences and beliefs. They give greater scrutiny to and look for reasons to reject the validity of contradictory claims. Because most real-world bodies of evidence have flaws, inconsistencies, and ambiguities, people motivated to accept or reject a claim can often find at least some grounds for doing so. And this is true for scientists, as well as for advocacy group leaders, as well as for our policymakers. So this is, this is the reality, if you will, that one has to deal with, if attempting to engage uh, the policy process. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about how scientists behave and the in impact that that has in terms of engaging the policy process. I suspect that if you were to look at this cartoon as objectively as one can, you'll probably come to this interpretation. And that is, the problem is, the scientist wants to get good information out, and it's only when the policymakers gets his or her hands on it that it becomes misinformation. Well, we know that the policymakers are quite guilty of doing that, but I think scientists are as well, and I want to give you some examples. Um, this is a study that was done in 2009. It was done of press releases, uh, which were issued by uh, universities, uh, academic medical centers. Um, and the, the key to look at is at the very last second half, when it talks, it says 29% of the releases were rated as exaggerating the findings importance. This was due to various criteria the authors had set up. And almost all releases, including investigative quotes, included investigative quotes, 26% of which were judged 
to overstate research importance. That's not trivial. That's not trivial. Overstating the importance in the policy arena, as heated as it gets, can really be counterproductive. All of you may have a particular example. Here's one of my favorites uh, by a former president of Princeton University. I'm sure that many of you in the audience have cringed in the face of newspaper or media reports extolling the promise that stem cells will cure everything from Alzheimer's disease to halitosis. The newspapers and TV commentators did not make that up. They get that information from scientists themselves, and one of my favorite phrases, who practice a variation of irrational exuberance. Now, what scientist doesn't want to portray his or her work as being as best as it can be, with an impact as great as it can have? Now, some of us are less inclined to those kinds of exaggerations than others. I'm not indicting the, the, the whole class of scientists. What I'm simply saying is there are far more of these examples that I could point to in the literature from people who have studied scientific communication that scientists themselves bear part of the responsibility for how science is handled in the, process, in the policy process because they tend to exaggerate. Why do they exaggerate? Well, they want to do good. They want more grant money. They want promotions. They want to be invited to give talks at various meetings. And they want various um, awards, just like anybody else in any other profession. And so one of the things we have to be careful about as scientists is to keep this in mind, that the more we do this, the more it impinges on our credibility. Not only does it impinge on our credibility, but as this quote suggests, it can also undermine a policy. If indeed, if scientists exaggerate the science and what the data tell us in any particular policy assessment, it may well be that it ends up backfiring and the policy gets nowhere or something else is adopted which would not be the choice of most people if they had an opportunity to vote on that policy. So it doesn't do us any good to exaggerate if we're found out, if you will, and you'll be found out in a policy process where everybody's looking for every flaw in what you have to say. The other problem it raises, it seems to me, is this notion of accountability. To the extent that you engage in irrational exuberance, aren't you accountable? to someone in that concern? Well, you're accountable to the funder. You're accountable to your colleagues and collaborators, your co-authors, to the larger scientific community, particularly your field. You're also accountable to the public, perhaps to the policy process. So we, as scientists, have to recognize that we can not only impinge on our credibility, we can not only end up causing a good policy not to be adopted, but we also need to be held accountable for what we do. So errors, or at least inflated claims, if you will, about various impacts, uh, can be a result of at least two causes, generally speaking. One is sort of an unconscious adherence to certain assumptions and orientations. This is the way people view the world. This is the perspective that I was talking about earlier. <coughs> People view the world in a certain way, and it's just very natural for them to do it. That's the way the brain works. We all do it. In other cases, however, it might be due to motivational bias, which is driven by an explicit preference for a particular outcome. That is, you are an advocate. You're a scientist who's an advocate. Some people would say that that doesn't work. That's an oxymoron. You can't be an objective, reasonable scientist and at the same time advocate using your work. I don't mean an advocate for something else that's totally removed from your work. But as citizens, you're capable of advocating. You're entitled to be advocates. But they're very different, the unconscious motivation and the conscious motivation. I think both operate in science and policy, and we have to be careful about recognizing both of them. One of my favorite authors who writes about science in this book, Everyday Practice of Science, Fred Grinnell, who himself is a, excuse me, an expert on wound research, that's where he's made his reputation, says we can aim to be objective but cannot escape the context of our unique life experience. Goes on to say opportunities for misinterpretations, error, and self-deception abound. 
again, something that's important to know, both when you're doing research and when you're taking that research outside of the lab or outside of the field. We're all afflicted by this. And sometimes it can come back and haunt us. And I'm very much worried that, the sci that scientists generally uh, simply don't take this into account when engaging in the policy process. And they probably would be better off not engaging in the policy process. But that's not what we want to encourage. We want some of our best scientists to get involved and to get engaged. So John Locke, uh, way back in 1690, reminded us that all men and women, that's an editorial uh, comment, are liable to error, and most men are in many points by passion or interest under temptation to do it. Again, maybe recognized or maybe unrecognized. Let me give you an example. Lord Kelvin is really one of the one of the primary scientists of all time. Very, very famous, uh, had a great career, but for some reason he got stuck on one particular issue that gnawed at him, and that was the age of the earth. So back in his day, he was estimating the age of the earth at no more than 400 million years, whereas many, many other scientists were saying, no, no, it's far older, it's billions of years. Well, we know now it's about 4.5 billion years. But he was unmoved, despite the fact the evidence was pretty compelling. So this is what a uh, reviewer, uh, Marcia uh, Bartuzia, wrote uh, about a book called Brilliant Blunders, in which he was one of the case studies, wrote about what happened. She said that psychological studies suggest that people make decisions based on more on personal experience than on actual data. Scientists are no exception. Kelvin's sin was holding on to an opinion even when confronted with massive contradictory evidence. He had been admired for his scientific progress for so long that he couldn't give up the drug of being right. And that's sort of a metaphor, the drug of being right for perspective. He saw it as 400 million years old, and that's what he stuck with, despite the fact the evidence was overwhelming, and he was an excellent scientist. So even the best and the brightest can be affected, if you will, depending upon what they bring to the lab or to the table. So I want to, again, just sort of summarize by indicating that this is a fact of doing science. It's a fact of reporting scientists, and it's something that we all need to keep in mind. And there's a considerable amount of good scientific evidence suggesting this is the case beyond individual cases that uh, one might uh, uh, point out. Okay, so here we are. We've, we've looked at some of the issues associated with how we portray, how we perceive evidence, facts, etc. We know that it's a mixed bag, that we tend to see things, we look at the same thing but see it differently because of the baggage we bring to the table. We know that's true of all of us in the room as well as very good scientists, as well as policy makers. We know that the policy process is messy, that it's tough to navigate, particularly if you don't know all the ins and outs, and that science is just one of many factors that are taken into account. I've gone even further and suggested to you that, in a sense, scientists are their own worst enemy when they get into the policy process. I'm generalizing, of course, there are exceptions. But when they get into the policy process, they tend to think it from their perspective of things, that the data are clear-cut. How could anyone disagree? And here's how they ought to be applied to a particular issue in order to develop some sort of policy options that are likely to be uh, successful. Given all of that, one might ask, well, why bother? Maybe we should keep our scientists locked up. Keep them away from Washington or your state capital. I mean, my goodness, they're just going to mess things up and they'll give us all a bad name. Well, it so happens that in a survey in 2009, there were many people, including scientists, who thought it was a great idea to become politically active. So there's some data that, generally speaking, the community sees value in this. It may or may not be good for them, we don't know that from the data, but generally speaking, they think there's great value in this. And the head of the AAAS, Alan Leshner, had an editorial in 2008 in which he said every U.S. scientist should embrace science advocacy as a meaningful part of the job. Every. I don't happen to think he's right, but I do happen to be sympathetic to the point that scientists do need to be engaged, and it will be better off if they do, 
but they have to do with certain sensitivities that I'll talk about momentarily. So, here are some slides which just show you that the, the scientific community has sort of picked up on this notion of becoming involved. These are some websites from some different scientific societies, different kinds of disciplines, just to give you an idea. Here's a page devoted to policy and advocacy. Here's one from the psychologist, public interest advocacy. Here's one from the Association of Education Research. Uh, uh, education Research Associate, the Ed American Education Research Association, Research Policy and Advocacy. You know when things have really caught on, if you will, uh, when a university, in this case Georgetown Medical Center, announces with great fanfare that the Department of Microbiology and Immunology offers a unique MS degree in Biomedical Science Policy and Advocacy. Well, there must be something there if the university is going to make that investment. And of course you have your MA program uh, in Science Policy and, and, and Bioethics. So clearly, there's something going on here. There is a feeling in the country within the scientific community we ought to get engaged. We ought to be involved. Which now takes me back to my very first slide about that missing link. What is the missing link that I'm referring to and I've alluded to during the course of my, my talk? And I'm going to try to describe it to you and I would welcome your reactions and comments during the discussion. Well, the missing link isn't due to, you know, shorter facts or data. We don't need more facts and data in most cases. There's much more going on than facts, than the exchange of facts and data. So what steps should scientists take to meet their responsibilities in improving the science-society relationship, particularly in the context of public policy? So I'm going out on the limb, and I'm going to say that all the following, and there are six recommendations that I'm going to make, should be incorporated into the education of all scientists. Undergrad, grad, postdocs, med school, dental school, whatever the case might be. If you're going to be engaged in science, I think you ought to follow these following six recommendations. And somehow I think they ought to be incorporated into education, and most of that occurs at the universities. So I'm putting the onus on all of you to find a way to convince your colleagues, that these six factors ought to be part of an education of a scientist. They ought to acknowledge what I'm about to show you. They ought to have an understanding of these things before they get engaged rather than after they get engaged. Okay. Step number one, and these are not in any particular order. Understand that science and scientists do not operate in a vacuum. There's always a context for doing science, for interpreting science, and for reporting science. If you understand that, then I think it will sort of increase your sensitivity to the power of perspective. One of the best courses a scientist might be able to take is a philosophy of science course, where they really talk about this and how perspective is very important for understanding what you are seeing and interpreting it. So I think this is very much an important part of being a good scientist to the extent that you want to get engaged in the policy process. That's the first one. Here's the second. Engage in perspective getting as much as perspective taking. The problem with the latter is that it often tends to blame the public for its ignorance. If only they knew what I knew. If only they understood better they would go along with what I am proposing, how we should use the science. I think if you, that's sort of perspective taking. You're taking it. But if you reach out and try very hard to understand the perspectives of others, I think it will open more lines of communication and strengthen the science-society relationship. Third, appreciate that people politicians included, make decisions on the basis of self-interest and their own hopes, fears, and values, which will not necessarily match what many researchers deem as self-evident, leading to the insight that the views and behavior of non-scientists about science and its uses are not irrational. For many people of a particular religious persuasion, the notion of using embryonic stem cells in research 
is something that they simply will not find acceptable no matter how much data you show them. Is that irrational? Well, maybe it is from your point of view. But after all, think of their experience, their life experience, their upbringing, their exposure. From their point of view, the way they're interpreting and seeing what you're showing them, what you're telling them, is very rational. And we have to be really careful as scientists not to think that these people are dumb, they're irrational, they're crazy. That is typically not the case. There are exceptions, of course. So it's very important to understand this and sort of approach the table with the non-scientists with a certain degree of respect and humility. Number four, acknowledge that the question of what scientists are good at doing must be accompanied by the question of what are we good for. By this I mean develop a way of thinking about what you're doing and what its broader implications are. How is it likely to affect people? How are they likely to see what you see? What are the implications of what you're doing? To the extent that you think more broadly, besides getting that next paper in science, and you're going to be more sensitive to what others bring to the table. And in the end, you may not be able to agree with them, but at least you will have heard what they have to say. And at least you will be able to say, there is value in what I do. It's not that I'm just good at doing what I do, which of course is what universities are all about, graduating students and professionals who are good at what they do. What I'm simply saying is, okay, I'm good at what I do, but what is what I'm doing for? What does it enhance? Where do we go from here? I think that's very important as well because policy is basically the allocation of values. Choosing from among different sets of values in order to go forward and have a policy. People want to know the value of your work. Five, realize that scientists must deal with issues and questions beyond the technical and that they need to address audiences increasingly comprised of more than just science. This should help scientists be more open to an even-handed conversation with others, particularly non-scientists, and hopefully a greater understanding of their perspective on the issues. So I think it's terribly important, obviously, those who want to go out into the broader societal uh, arena, into the policy-making arena, they already have a sense that they're going to have to be speaking to non-technical audiences. But when you're going out and talking about your work, whether it's to a, a, a local service club in the area or the U.S. Congress, I think it's very important to understand your audience. To whom are you communicating? What is the message that you want to convey? Very important. And then finally, number six. Yes. Recognize the limitations of your training as scientists to operate effectively in the policy arena, acquire the skills needed to be effective, and develop some sort of rules of engagement for yourself, for your discipline, whatever the, the case might be, about playing, uh, playing fairly, if you will, in the, in the policy uh, sandbox. Um, this is where I think education comes in. But before that, you've got to have people who are at least primed to learn, primed to understand. And so the message I have is that all scientists should have exposure very early on in their training to the limitations of what science can tell us and to the limitations of their ability to interact into the, in the policy process. And as they go through their education, these limitations will presumably change. They will become better, hopefully, at whatever it is they're doing. But it doesn't come by osmosis and it doesn't come by the ordinary training of a scientist. Like your science and society program, you have to make an effort to reach out and provide opportunities for different uh, exposure, different skills, different opportunities. It's great to be a great scientist, but if you want to combine that with also doing good, and I know many people do, then it seems to me you have to know what does doing good mean to anybody else but you? And how do you communicate that effectively? So finally, to end up, I want to introduce you to the AAAS mascot. <laughs> and uh, he and I would be delighted to, to get your questions or reactions or comments in about 10 minutes or so we have left. Thank you very much.
Yes. What do you think is the best way for scientists who are interested in entering this arena to gain this kind of training? I realize, you know, sort of to your sixth point that you made, I realize that AAAS has great programs in this area, but what can what can people do sort of as first steps to get to the point where they've gained the understanding of their limitations in the arena and how to overcome them? Well, I do know that there are opportunities for high school students. I do know, not, not from AAAS, but out there. There are opportunities for undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, and faculty, if you will, to get access to this kind of training along the way. Uh, but I think it ultimately has to sort of be cultivated into, inculcated into the educational system. That is, you have to have a faculty who's willing to say, look, I think you're doing great work and you're, you're the most proficient student I've ever had with a biped. Biped, but what, what are you doing this for? Let's talk about that a little bit. You ought to have these discussions with one another. Uh, and share information and insights. There are more formalized programs as you go on that are selective, which means that not any one program is going to solve the situation. If we had every university embracing those six points that I made by inculcating it into the educational system, they could do much more than AAAS could possibly do. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this is almost a, a devil's advocate kind of question, but in a situation where you know, funding is limited and there's tremendous pressure on scientists to present their data as, or their project as, you know, earth shattering. I mean, I can, I can think of lots of examples in my own department where the way that they sell their research has very little to do with what their even actu actual goals are. They're not necessarily looking at drug discovery, but the things that they're doing are important, but it's really hard to sell. Well, this information could be important someday. And so, it's, it's a tough situation to be in, and, and so I guess I'm just wondering if you might be able to address how, how to sort of find a middle ground where you're not overselling it, but at the same time you're competitive in a situation where you need to be competitive. Yeah, it's a very good question. Do you, uh, I, I don't know where you are in your career, do you get any funding from NSF or NIH? Yeah. Or can get them? Okay, both of those um, agencies, big funders of science in the United States, have certain criteria for evaluating proposals. For NSF, it's called broader impacts. That is, they want to know what you think the broader impacts would be. Now, you're right, there's the danger of overselling, and it's very difficult to know what those broader impacts would be, to know and really know what you're just proposing. But nevertheless, I'm making the point, and NIH, by the way, asks for its significance, reviewers to take it, not just for the field, but for larger society. So what I simply want to say is that society, generally through its policy-making bodies, has basically said, we're fed up with just scientists doing their narrow little thing, working on worms or firms or whatever it might be. We want to know this money's going into something that may have some social utility down the road. Okay, so there's an opportunity for you the other part of it is, of course, being careful not to engage in irrational exuberance. It can backfire. Right now, there is a big political debate in the House of Representatives over NSF giving grants to certain scientists where the work to some people looks frivolous, unnecessary, and not a good use of taxpayers' money. That's a problem. That, that tells you right away that there are some people in our U.S. Congress who control the purse strings who are very sensitive to these kinds of things. That's why I said earlier, to the extent that you get carried away and go oversell, it can be very counterproductive. It can be very counterproductive. I think you have to talk with someone when you're writing your proposals, when, you're, when you are selling, if you will, your, your, um, your work, um, who might be able to provide a little bit of a sounding board so that you don't go over the line. And I, I can't tell you there's a clear line. I, I can't tell you that. It depends a lot on the audiences, the field, et cetera. Um, I think we all like to think there's something way down the road that will come of good from our work. And you can say, you know, ultimately, I hope this will be the building block, foundation for work that will lead to X or Y or whatever the case may be. But to add, this is not going to happen in the immediate future. And you can point to a lot of science where that's been the case. I mean, whatever examples that our members of Congress will tell us about stuff that they think is frivolous, not worthy of funding, et cetera, we can point to a whole category of research that nobody had any idea where it would end. And it came to, it came to be very productive. So there are no easy answers to that. But I think we are, to the extent that 
that society is saying we want you to do useful work, however that might be defined, you're now obligated to do useful work. Okay, it's not license to exaggerate, but it is a message from society. We value what you have, and we want you to put it to good work. But you have to be real careful. I mean, to the extent that some reporter or some member of Congress was to find out what you just conveyed to us a few minutes ago about how some of your colleagues are going over the line in your judgment, that's, that can't possibly have a positive impact. Can't possibly have a positive. It's just not going to look at, make any of us look good. But there is no easy, clear line. Be cautious. Be honest as you can. Yes. Um, I was going to say that I actually think that um, the, part, the training for scientists in this starts early, and I think there's a part that you didn't mention, which is that um, we're kind of trained to fit our research into a story, into a narrative framework, and if there's there's a couple of different tropes in that. But I don't know how many sessions I've sat in on where somebody said, okay, we're going to submit this paper to Nature. How do we make this as interesting as possible? Which is not the same thing as saying, how do we make this as how do we convey the complexity of our study as adequately and correctly as possible? And also, I think the thing, a thing that happens at the university level is a lot of scientists are being told by the university to also frame their research into a story. Um, so, for example, my husband is attending, he's a math faculty, is attending a session where they're told, you know, how to write um, things for the public press. And there's not, and I've heard that a lot of this doesn't really focus on conveying caveats and complexities. And so I think that it's, I don't, I don't know, I think there's something, it seems, I think that it, you're right that there's this backlash because I think from the public's perspective, their reaction is not irrational. They see a lot of arrogance. And from the people who actually have the most knowledge of the limitations of what they're doing, and we're not conveying those limitations, I don't know, I think, so. Well, I, I mean, I think... I think that putting it in a story framework is actually especially um, troubling. Well, the story, of course, represents a reflex perspective. Well, that's the way humans think, right? Yes, yes. That's, we I all understand. remember the story of how penicillin was discovered, right? Um, we remember our fairy tales from our childhoods. But I think the public remembers those stories long after they're true. Well, let me just respond by saying that I don't have an easy answer. I mean, I empathize with all that you've said. I think it's true. Uh, nevertheless, it's a skill to be able to write or speak quickly and throw in a caveat or two. It's not easy to do. And that's, that is an issue. But there are skills to help you do that. And I'm not an expert in it. But there are people who are. And my point is that those kinds of skills ought to be as part of the education of scientists. Even if you don't think as a scientist when you're 25, 26, going through your graduate work that you're going to, anything you do is going to end up in the public arena. You don't know. And it doesn't necessarily depend only on you. Right. We have cases where people have taken other people's work and used it to advocate their point of view. And the original researcher just had no, uh, no expectation. So I just think to be safe, if you will, let's get that exposure early and develop those skills, as your, hopefully your husband will. Over here, I've not been, yes? So I can not agree more with your point that you made on perspective and how important it is. And I think that as a follow-up to some of the things that have been made, one of the issues in the scientific community is the perspective that you can't be competitive without making some of these exaggerated claims. And so I think that somehow addressing scientists and changing their perspective that you can accurately portray your research and get your grant approved. There needs to be some connection because there's this idea that everyone else is doing it. And if you're not doing it, then you won't be competitive even if your research truly is in reality. Again, that's, you know, that's what's out there in the environment. Those are the mixed messages that people are given. Those are the mixed messages that people are hearing. Um, I think that um, leaders of science uh, can make a difference in how they, what they say and how they behave towards younger scientists in terms of expectations. 
I think the funders of science can really play a significant point. Journals that accept or reject manuscripts can play a significant point in getting <coughs> these matters out on the table. And slowly but surely, perhaps, having some change in the culture. But it is a system which makes it very difficult for scientists not to get carried away at times. I understand that. Uh, my point was...